Honorable guests, uh, Mr. Khawar Qureshi Saab, Sadar Lahore High Court Bar, uh, Anwarul Haq Panu Saab, Naib Sadar Noor Samad Khan Saab, Finance Secretary uh, Hafiz Allah Yar Sipra Saab, Rana Shazad Saab, Zafar Kala Nauri Saab. These names are not about the name of the name. I have decided that I will do it in Urdu because the next one hour of Khawar Qureshi will listen to English in English. So, Khawar Qureshi is not about the name of the name of the name. And uh, uh, उनकी बड़ी मेहरबानी है कि उन्होंने अपने मसरूफियात से uh, हमें एक घंटा दिया और वो स्पेशली लंदन से लाहौर आए और उन्होंने एग्री किया कि वो आप सब के साथ शेयर करेंगे अपने व्यूज़ ऑन इंटरनेशनल लॉ और जो जो प्रॉब्लम्स पाकिस्तान फेस कर रहा है इन द इंटरनेशनल अरीना क्योंकि खाबर कुरैशी साहब वो इंसान हैं जिन्होंने जिनको फर्स्ट हैंड एक्सपीरियंस है कि किस तरह की प्रॉब्लम्स आती हैं वन जब आप इंटरनेशनल फोरम्स पे जाते हैं और खाबर कुरैशी साहब की एक जो जिस केस का मैं जिक्र करना चाहता हूँ अमरीन ने पहले भी जिक्र कर दिया उसका जो कि एक हैदराबाद फंड केस के लाता है और ये केस में उन्होंने पाकिस्तान की मैं कहता हूँ इतनी खिदमत की है कि 35 मिलियन पाउंड्स वो उधर पड़े थे इंडियन अकाउंट में सिंस 1947 और वो 2016 में वो ये केस जीते हैं और इंटरनेशनल फोरम ने उन्हें इंडियन गवर्नमेंट को ये ऑर्डर दिया है कि वो जो हैं पैसे वो पाकिस्तान को दिए जाएं जो कि 70 साल से वहाँ पे पड़े थे तो इसके लिए खावर साहब की जो कोशिशें उनको मैं दाद देता हूँ और अब मैं दावत दूंगा खावर प्रेशी साहब को जो कि आके आप लोगों से अपना व्यू पॉइंट बयान करेंगे और आप लोगों को इनलाइटन करेंगे थैंक यू Firstly, thank you to Osama and his colleagues for inviting me to join you today in this very impressive lecture hall. We don't have a lecture hall like this for the Bar Council of England and Wales. This is a lecture hall that needs to be used more often. What do I want to do in the next half an hour? I want to explain to you why Pakistan, which has been in existence for more than 70 years, needs to take international law more seriously. And why each and every one of you has the potential to help Pakistan on the journey towards greater prosperity. The title of the talk is Implications of International Law for Pakistan. There's a PowerPoint, can you see it? On the left-hand side to me, right-hand side to you, there is a soft copy and a hard copy. Osama has copies at the front. Anybody who doesn't have a copy, ask Osama. There'll be time for questions, and I'd like you to raise questions with me, because what I want to be able to do is explain to you, you're all lawyers or students, very experienced lawyers, students who want to become experienced lawyers, some of you have started specializing in international law, public international law, and that's extremely important. What I'm gonna start off by doing is explaining to you what is public international law? Then, why does it matter? And lastly, why does it matter to Pakistan? And ultimately, I want to give you some suggestions as to how you can change the situation for the better because I've been in practice now nearly 30 years and I don't believe there is any situation that cannot be changed for the better if you have a positive attitude. And inshallah in Pakistan, all of you must maintain a positive attitude to ensure that the changes that are about to take place are changes that you support for the better. So firstly, what is public international law? Public international law is nothing new. It's the legal regime which operates between states. Now, Pakistan has been a state since the 14th of August, 1947. 
So it's older than I and older than many of you in the room. But there are many ways in which Pakistan has yet to develop itself in terms of public international law. Public international law provides for the rules by which states interact with each other, mainly through the United Nations. All of you have heard of the United Nations. Pakistan has an excellent permanent representative at the United Nations, Malia Halodi, who's doing a superb job for Pakistan at the moment. In the United Nations, there are two forums. One is the Security Council, the other is the General Assembly. The Security Council has five permanent members, the United States of America, the Russian Federation, China, France, and the United Kingdom. The United Nations Security Council can pass resolutions which have a binding effect, including sanctions. Some of you will be aware of sanctions that were imposed against Iran. Those sanctions were relaxed as a result of an international agreement. And yesterday, the United States, on its own, reimposed sanctions against Iran. Is that legal or not? You can ask me that question and we can discuss it. Also, states agree through treaties, agreements between states to provide for some rights and obligations. One of the most important treaties for Pakistan is the Indus Water Treaty. Has anybody in this room not heard of the Indus Water Treaty? I'm glad to hear that. From 1961. Now the Indus Water Treaty is supposed to provide for the means by which Pakistan and India regulate the flows of water through uh, Pakistan and India and control the flow of water. In 2011, there was an arbitration finding which concerns the way in which the water flow is to be regulated by India as it comes through to Pakistan. So that's one example of a treaty. All of you, if you fly, you travel on aeroplanes, and aeroplanes can only pass from one state to another because of treaties, uh, civil aviation treaties from the 1940s onwards. The United Nations Charter limits the way in which force can be used, provides for use of force in self-defense. There are many international organizations the World Trade Organization provides for rules for trade. The World Health Organization provides for regulations relating to standards for health and safety. UNESCO is another international organization whose responsibility it is to protect world heritage sites, including the Taj Mahal and other important sites which need to be preserved because they have significance for us as human beings. If we don't value our history and our culture, we are unlikely to have much of a future. Environmental protection. I was discussing this with some of your colleagues earlier. There are treaties that provide for environmental protection. Unfortunately, those treaties are not honored. Unfortunately still, the United States, which is one of the major polluters, through its present president, has decided not to follow the most recent accord, the Paris Accord. Once one state decides not to follow a treaty, then of course it undermines the efficiency of the entire process. However, make no mistake, one of the biggest challenges facing us as human beings at the moment is environmental change. We are seeing temperatures that we've never seen before in England, and we keep on calling them exceptional. Seven weeks without rain, 48 degrees in Spain. It's exceptional this year. It's likely to become normal next year and the year after. What are the long-term consequences for us as human beings? deforestation, 
taking water out of the ground, polluting our environment, extracting carbon. These are all matters that can and should be regulated by treaties. They are, to some extent, but not nearly as effectively as they could be. International law also provides for diplomatic immunity, state immunity. Very recently, you had an incident in Islamabad where an individual was killed by a US official who was a member of the US mission. Was he or was he not entitled to diplomatic immunity? This is provided for by an international convention, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic and Consular Relations. State immunity. Pakistan has a high commission in London. Pakistan has assets in London. Is Pakistan a state? Is Pakistan and its assets entitled to claim immunity? We have legislation in England, the State Immunity Act, which provides for immunity. You have similar legislation in Pakistan. And none of this is complicated once you begin to understand that international law is simply another framework which provides for the interaction between states and representatives of states, as well as international organizations. That's what public international law is. And wherever you have a state or a state official involved, you're likely to have some element of public international law. I've given you some simple examples. Why does it matter? It matters enormously. Because every single day, somewhere in the world, there is some issue involving public international law. Whether it is, for example, the US reimposing sanctions on Iran at the beginning of this week, whether it is Brexit in the United Kingdom and the UK taking itself away from the EU treaty arrangements as of next year, whether it's the relationship between Pakistan and India, the question of Kashmir, these are all matters that have their foundation in public international law. Why does it matter for Pakistan? Pakistan is a member of the United Nations. Pakistan can participate effectively in the United Nations through the General Assembly, which is the equivalent of a parliament. It can sometimes make law, international law, but mostly that's done in the Security Council. But you can only participate if you have knowledgeable, experienced representatives. Pakistan has a population of 200 million people. It has engaged in conflicts, armed conflicts, with its neighbor, India. Ten weeks after independence, the first conflict concerning Kashmir. In the Sindh, there was a conflict in 1965 concerning the run of Kutch, which led to an arbitration. Arbitration is a way in which you settle disputes outside court. And in that arbitration, the award in 1968 gave 90% of the land to India and 10% to Pakistan. Pakistan has been before the International Court of Justice on at least five occasions since independence. What is the International Court of Justice? Just to help you understand this, the International Court of Justice sits in The Hague in the Netherlands. It's a beautiful building that was donated by a very rich American industrialist who, just before he was about to die, decided he wanted to do some good. If only there were more multi-billionaires who wanted to do some good. We have people like Bill Gates, who have donated a huge amount, largely in the health sector, education also. And Mr. Zuckerberg has promised that he's going to distribute his wealth. Let's see what the founder of Amazon does in terms of what he has and what Apple does to contribute to the greater good. Apple is worth one trillion dollars. Think about the national debt of Pakistan. Apple is worth 10 times the national debt of Pakistan. Multinational corporations and how they're regulated is an interesting question, not for today, because they have more power than some states. But international law doesn't apply to them. Commercial law applies to them. Coming to the ICJ, it's the court that sits in The Hague, 
where the United Nations member states, most of them, in fact, almost all of them, have given the court jurisdiction by signing an agreement. In addition, they sign treaties which have clauses, conditions in them, that in the event of a dispute, they will give the court jurisdiction. The first time Pakistan appeared before the ICJ was in 1971, when there was a dispute uh, as a result of India refusing Pakistani civilian planes passage over Indian territory. That dispute led to a, a decision in 1973 about the court uh, and whether or not it had jurisdiction under the Chicago Convention of 1944. The second concerned the Bangladesh-East Pakistan conflict, where India was going to transfer 195 Pakistani prisoners of war for alleged genocide to the Bangladeshi authorities for trial. Pakistan tried to bring a claim before the International Court of Justice. That was challenged by India on the grounds of jurisdiction, but ultimately the case was taken out of court. After that, the third occasion was in 1999, a case concerning a Pakistani plane that was shot down, the aerial incident case. Pakistan brought a case before the ICJ and the ICJ concluded it didn't have jurisdiction. Jurisdiction exists when states, through an agreement, a treaty, clearly say in the event of a dispute the court will have jurisdiction. The fourth case was brought by a little island called the Marshall Islands in 2014 under the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Pakistan isn't a signatory to it, but the Marshall Islands brought a case against Pakistan and other states, arguing that these states weren't doing enough to eliminate nuclear weapons. Now, because Pakistan is not a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, Pakistan and India and the USA and the UK successfully argued that the court didn't have jurisdiction. The last that Pakistan has been before the ICJ is the case that many of you have heard about, the Kulbushin Jadav case concerning the Indian spy. Now, I've said as much as I can say about that case in a magazine called Newsweek on the 14th of July, and I would invite you all to read it. If you want to see a summary of the case, the pleading that I drafted in response to the Indian claim is about 130 pages with about seven volumes of annexes. And the pleading I drafted in response to the final pleading of India is about 90 pages with 300 pages of annexes. Look at the last page of the Newsweek interview. You'll see the summary of the case in six paragraphs. The pleadings will be on the ICJ website at some point when the ICJ makes them public, but you can find out more about the case by reading that article interview, which is only three weeks old. So that's the last occasion that the Pakistan has been before the International Court of Justice. Pakistan has distinguished itself in international law in the past, but your generation can do much more. The first foreign minister of Pakistan was Sir Zafarullah Khan. And when I was teaching at King's College London, which is not far from my office, I would walk past his portrait every day because he was a student of King's College London, a brilliant international lawyer, the first foreign minister of Pakistan from 1947 to 1954, who subsequently was the president of the International Court of Justice from 1970 to 1973. Some of the most important decisions of the ICJ were given by the court involving him. You should read more about him because he's a great example for all of you uh, as to how Pakistan has possessed brilliant legal talent and each and every one of you should aspire to be like him. That's the ICJ. What other fora has Pakistan been before? There is a convention called the International Convention for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, ICSID. Its headquarters are in Washington. The ICSID convention provides protection for foreign investors who invest in another state. Pakistan has tried to attract foreign investment for decades. The first treaty to protect foreign investment actually was signed in 1959 between Germany and Pakistan. Now there are three and a half thousand investment treaties called bilateral investment treaties because they involve two states, 
So think about that. Germany signed the first ever investment treaty with Pakistan in 1959. What does that tell you about the position of Pakistan in 1959? That one of the major industrial powers on this planet considered Pakistan to be a place that they wanted to invest in, that they were keen to invest in, in 1959. A lot has changed since. But if that's how people felt in 1959 about Pakistan, is it impossible to, for them to feel the same about, again about Pakistan? I don't think so. In 1989, the first dispute, the first claim against Pakistan was brought under this treaty framework by an oil company called Occidental. After that, there were various other claimants. 2003, a claim by a, comp a Swiss company called SJS, a claim by a Turkish company called Bayinder in 2005, a claim by a, a company called Impreglio. These were all claims that were handled very successfully by the government when you had, as your Attorney General, uh, an outstanding lawyer, Magdoum Ali Khan. More recently, unfortunately, Pakistan has been facing the prospect of billions of dollars of liability. Three cases. Firstly, the TCC ca case, Tetian Copper, otherwise known as Rikadek. That case has been going through an ICSID, International Center for Investment Disputes Tribunal, for years. Pakistan has been found liable. Now the only question is, for how much? The claim is for $11 billion. The second case is a case called Karke, where Turkish claimants have brought a claim for $2 billion concerning the power supply sector. Again, here, there's not much information that's been made available by the government. And as a result, you lawyers, you members of the public, don't know what's happened in that case. I believe, and I've written about this since 2006, Osama should have circulated a flyer, a sheet, which identifies some of my books. I've written in my book about investment treaties how it's important for the public to know how much money has been brought in by foreign investment and how big the claims are that are being brought against a state, as well as how much money is being spent on legal fees. In the Karke case, members of the public have no idea as to how much Pakistan is exposed for. The broadsheet case, NAB hired a foreign company to help recover assets. Then NAB settled through its lawyer the claim with the wrong company. And now NAB is exposed to a claim for $300 million. What's happening with that claim? But none of us on the basis of public information can tell you. I was very pleased to read the headline today of the potential new finance minister who said that the CPAC contractual arrangements will be made public. There's nothing wrong with transparency. If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear from transparency. And transparency is extremely important. So that's ICSID. Now, what is my observation from my work all over the world, for and against governments in South America, in Africa, in Central Europe, Russian Federation, Kazakhstan, Southeast Asia, United Kingdom, USA, more recently Pakistan. My observations are as follows. Firstly, it's not good enough just to criticize whether it's the United Nations or commercial law or international law. All of you follow cricket, I assume. If you don't know the rules of cricket, how can you expect to play the game? And if you don't know the rules of the game, how can you expect to win? If you are a state, Pakistan is a state of 200 million people with huge potential. It's unfortunate that Pakistan doesn't take itself seriously enough to invest in law. 
Uh, earlier on, you, you were told that I have acted for states all over the world, and I am the only lawyer ever to have acted for India and Pakistan and done two cases between India and Pakistan. That's not a bad thing. I believe it's a good thing, because India wasn't forced to use me. They hired me instead of some very senior English lawyers. And when I acted for them on the biggest claim ever brought against India in 2004 by commercial giants General Electric, Bechtel and Enron, the $7 billion claim, which we settled for less than $200 million, India was shocked. The Indian government was shocked. They didn't understand investment treaties. Now, the best, one of the best model investment treaties has been generated by Indian scholars. In 14 years, they've learned. The USA has developed very good investment treaties. China is a major foreign investor. China's investment treaties are very strong and protect Chinese investors very effectively. I remember going to China in 1998 with the UK government on an official visit with the Prime Minister to speak to Chinese lawyers about commercial law in a room five times the size of this, where nobody asked any questions. 20 years later, Chinese, for whom English was not their first language, have produced one of the clearest, strongest treaties on investment protection that you can find. What, what's the point? The point is that if Chinese can do this in 20 years, there's no reason why you can't. I give an example again and again of a country called Rwanda. How, how many of you know about Rwanda? Rwanda in 1994 had genocide. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed in six weeks. At the moment, Rwanda is the number one place to do business in Africa. 24 years after genocide, Rwanda has become the number one place to do business in Africa. 1995, I went to Poland to teach commercial law for one week. Now, 23 years later, Poland is one of the top destinations for business in Europe. Each and every one of you has a responsibility to ensure that when you study law and you practice law, you strive for best practice. There are people in this room who've gone to America, to England, and other countries to learn. That doesn't mean your law schools are not good enough, but the more knowledge you can get, the better. What I want to do is... I don't know what's happened with the mics. Can you hear me now? All right. The acoustics. So I want to conclude as follows. In any, any society that wants to progress, law and the rule of law is vital. In England, 65% of the cases before the English High Court don't involve English people. They involve foreigners. Why? Because they trust England more than their own courts. If you want Pakistan to achieve its rightful position internationally, is that better? If you want Pakistan to achieve its position internationally, better? Can you hear me? Pay more attention to law. There are many reforms that can take place to the courts, civil procedure, training for lawyers, and I know we shouldn't say this, training for judges. Of course, the judges are supposed to know the law. But in England, we have training for judges, regular training for judges. I'm a Deputy High Court judge since 2013, and every summer there is a course that judges attend to provide them with an update on procedure on different areas of law. I'm, I don't know whether that happens here, but it should. Law schools, awarding degrees, there should be some common standards. Should there be a professional exam for lawyers? Some would say yes. Public international law. I'm really pleased that you have an environmental committee. 
I'm delighted that Osama is chairing an international committee and you had two days of training here not so long ago. That's just the beginning. Much more needs to be done. You need to work together because in unity lies your strength. You have four provinces. The lawyers from all the four provinces need to come together. There are plenty of opportunities for you to learn and develop your understanding of law and public international law. I'm confident, inshallah, that each and every one of you, if you're lawyers, and it doesn't matter how old you are, or your students, will grasp those opportunities because they're there for the taking. And you will see how, as in the case of countries like Rwanda and Poland, this country, inshallah, will be transformed. Thank you. Is there a microphone? Uh, I think they'll speak out now. Uh, the house is now open for question and answers. And I think we'll have time for 6 or 7 questions. Because this hall is going to be used for another event. And but obviously it had the effect that people like yourself believed it was true. Correct? Even a year and a half later, you still believe it's true. Let me say again, utter rubbish. Please, read the Newsweek article. Don't look at social media. Don't look at the rubbish that calls itself news. Use your brains and think. Because, unfortunately, we live in an era now where thanks to social media, thanks to lazy journalism, it's very easy to spread a lie. And it's much more difficult to make people understand what the truth is. I'm pretty sure, I'm sorry to say, that not many of you have read the interview that Newsweek did of me. And I'm sorry because... <laughs> instead of standing here and talking about some stupid tweet, read that interview and then ask me questions. Next question. Uh, yeah, I like to add to what uh, Khawar Saab said that uh, if you go to the news and I think that Sanju movie you have seen from Sanju movie that you have seen from the news that you have seen from the news that the media and fake news so I think that look at the facts instead of the news You get more practical experience by showing that you have the aptitude and intelligence to be taken seriously by people who will then give you opportunities. If you move beyond laziness and actually bother to read and take your profession seriously and your professional responsibility seriously, then there's hope. I've had people here saying to me, sir, why is it, how is it that you acted for India and Pakistan? I've acted for 70 different governments all over the world, some of the most sensitive cases. You, if you use your brain, should, you, should see that as a source of pride. That India sacked two senior English QCs. I was 20 years younger than the most senior QC. The claim was the biggest claim ever brought against India. And they hired me. Not because of the color of my skin, but because of ability. Now, if you do not recognize ability and merit, then God help you. Next question. Look at the article, the interview, very clear interview. Again, idiots here, I'm sorry, and elsewhere, were talking about India winning, Pakistan losing. The interviewer quotes paragraph 60 of the ICJ order which says, nothing in this decision affects the merits. There's no judgment on the facts. Go to your court, you can get a stay order on a military court decision within hours. The Peshawar High Court very recently suspended the death sentence passed down by a military court within 12 hours. Pakistan and India both signed the Vienna Convention of 1963 and they gave the court jurisdiction. The court will hear this matter next year. 
and there will be a determination next year. I've said what I wanted to say and all that I can say in the Newsweek article. You must all understand that this is a case that's ongoing. So again, make some effort and read the, the interview. Uh, next question. Okay. So the question that was asked is, how can the USA unilaterally, means on its own, impose sanctions and walk away from an agreement which the EU states say Iran continues to honor? This is a, an important question, and it goes to part of what I was saying to you. I'm not here to criticize President Trump. Some people may say he's doing a good job himself to give as much ammunition to his critics. So definitely, I'm not here to criticize him. However, it's crystal clear that the rest of the European Union does not agree with President Trump when it comes to Iran. Whatever his motivation may or may not be, as a matter of law, I have yet to read one single credible, intelligent justification as a matter of law for what the USA is doing. But what is it doing? It's flexing its political muscles. The USA is one of the world's largest economies. Many transactions take place in dollars. And by imposing sanctions, dollar transactions are affected, and any entity that has a presence in the USA will think twice about doing business with Iran. And most of the world's corporations have some interaction with the USA. Is that moral? Is that fair? That's a completely separate question. But what's the solution? The solution is what I said to you before. Each and every one of you needs to know more about the law, the system, so that you can answer the question that was just raised as I have done. Uh, next question. Minat, Jay. That's, again, a, a, it's a, a, a question that's linked to what the USA has just done. However, think about a couple of situations that have taken place recently. The second Gulf War, 2003. Uh, General Powell in the United Nations with his lovely PowerPoint presentation. In England, what we call the dodgy dossier, the justification for invading Iraq. I was Treasury Council at the time, which means Council for the Government, and there were a lot of issues that I advised on, on international law, relating to matters of that nature. Might is never right. The truth is always right. 2018, now, unfortunately, some would say, we have seen disaster in Syria since 2011 because the world is afraid to intervene. The fear is that we intervened improperly in 2003 and then in 2011 in Libya and we shouldn't intervene again. So might isn't right. Short term it may be. Short term the bully always succeeds, but long term the bully never succeeds. Long term the liar never succeeds. So short term, last year, for two weeks, whoever was behind this uh, pathetic campaign against me may have succeeded. Short term, they may still be succeeding in the minds of some that are closed. But long term, inshallah, if you believe in God and you believe in the truth, a lie can never succeed. Let's have another question. Next question, please. There, back. Aage aajo.
La yes, and I'll repeat it as well. Of course, now, if you go on our website, www.magnetchambers.com, every three months we produce an update on international. In addition to which I have, two years ago, produced a book on international. Email me, I'll send you the first chapter, which is the introduction, and it has a reading list. There's plenty you can read. Don't be afraid of reading. The job of a lawyer, a good lawyer, is to make something look simple if they want to persuade somebody. The job of a bad lawyer is to make it look complicated. I often do cases that concern hundreds of thousands of documents. And it's not my job to tell the court or the arbitral tribunal what's in each and every document. Likewise, public international. Read it. Gain an interest in it. And you will, inshallah, see that it has so many practical implications. There are people in the audience here who've just come from abroad, far afield, and done some of the things that I was going to suggest you do. There's a colleague. Now, I'd like you to come to the front, if you don't mind. And then somebody else. I want to see how many of you have done anything similar in terms of going to the States to study, getting work experience in the United Nations. Just tell them a little bit about what you've done and who you are. My name is Samavia Sajjad and I recently graduated from UC Berkeley. And after that, I joined the United Nations for about one year in the Department of Fieldkeeping, Peacekeeping Operations. So I was told by a respected sir to tell a little bit about my more experience. So the application process of the United Nations is very lengthy along with how things work in Pakistan. But in the end, you feel very confident. You have so much trust in that there is so transparency that when you make a decision, you will be more willing to accept that decision. Secondly, once you start working in the United Nations, the first thing you note is you start accepting people's opinion, diverse opinion, because you work with a lot of people from international standards, for a lot of diplomats, a lot of officials. So it just generally opens up your mind to a more, more different approach towards life. You become open to new ideas. And then one thing which really was uh, fascinating for me and it made me learn a lot of things is how the whole United Nations is so working in collaboration with each other. They build each other up. It's not just within the departments, but in the United Nations, people build and encourage them. Once you get out of it, you are more confident. And I can say that personally, that I was confident enough to start up a think tank of my own once I got to Pakistan which works to bring Pakistani laws and policies in line with international standards. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have one more question and then we'll call uh, Mr. Zafar Kalonori to uh, give us five minutes of his time to speak on international arbitration and whatever he wants to. So, uh, one more question. The question is relating to investor claims. I explained to you there's a system to deal with foreign investor disputes. And there are agreements, treaties, that Pakistan has signed with many countries to protect the foreign investors. Criticisms of this process include the following. Arbitrators sit in comfortable five-star hotels. The proceedings are confidential. Lawyers like me argue. 
A judgment is given, it's called an award. Increasingly that's made public. But what happens after that, the states generally try not to tell their public because it may be embarrassing to somebody or other. Transparency is being promoted and encouraged in investor disputes. You can see ICSID proceedings live now through YouTube. Go on the ICSID website, you'll see many summaries of cases, pleadings of cases. Arbitrators, the people who decide the cases, now have to declare conflicts of interest. Ultimately, it's down to the stakeholders and civil society to demand greater transparency. As I said, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. That's what should happen. And before I close, once again, I want to thank you all for taking the time out in your vacation. Thank the Bar Association. Thank our friends and colleagues here for hosting me. Don't walk away without concluding that each and every one of you can make a difference. Don't hesitate to get in touch. I'm more than happy to share information with you. And I'm sure, inshallah, in two, three years' time, there'll be more individuals who'll be telling us that they've been to institutions in other parts of the world and engaged. Thank you.